Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining today's webinar. We're happy to see you. I see a bunch of people have joined already, and I look forward to seeing even more as we get started here this morning. This recording and the PowerPoint will be available after the webinar, and we'll provide information to those of you who joined on how to receive that. Today's webinar is on accounting for climate progress through harmonized GHG accounting. My name is Marianne Van Pelt. I work here at ICF, and I manage our USAID Rally project, which I'll um, introduce in a few minutes. I'm here with my colleague, Leslie Chinnery, and we will be um, splitting up today's presentation. I'll do the first half, and Leslie will do the second half. Leslie, would you like to say hello? Hello. Good morning. All right, so today we're going to be talking. We have about an hour. I hope we have about 10 minutes for Q&A at the end. We'll be presenting to you who Rally is, a brief introduction to our project, an overview of the harmonization framework, which is the subject of today's webinar. And then Leslie will dive in and talk about two new resources that we've recently published under the Rally project for energy sector harmonization and harmonization in the AFALU sector. Together, these three resources describe this harmonization process, which we hope will be of use to you, and I hope you'll be able to download it, use it, and follow it. The information at the very end uh, has some hyperlinks that you'll be able to follow to find some of these resources and more detail on the USAID Climate Links website. To start off, this work has been performed under the USAID RALLY project. RALLY stands for Resources to Advance Lead Implementation. It's been approximately a five-year project. It's nearing its completion. And that's uh, where we've done a variety of work like this. The objective of the activity implemented together between USAID and our, ourselves, ICF, as the implementing entity, was designed to support technically rigorous development and implementation of low emission development strategies, or LED. And the focus is really on providing tools and technical assistance to USAID and developing country partners. As a result, we've put quite a bit of material out for practitioners to use, and this is but one of several things that the Rally Project has been able to um, support. And I should note, it's important to note, that the work that I, we're presenting today was originally designed together with the country of Colombia. And we'll be providing some examples throughout of how we and our partners in the ministries in Colombia uh, designed this and tested it to ensure that it's useful and that the approach works. A little bit more detail on what Rally has done. We have a publicly available tool called the Clean Energy Emission Reduction Tool, which you should check out. And it is available for anyone's use to calculate the greenhouse gas emission reduction potential of a variety of energy sector investments. We also do some NDC implementation support. We've partnered with the likes of the NDC Partnership and others. And the flag there represents our partnership of activities together with Colombia. We've also worked with a variety of other countries, including some harmonization work right now that we're doing with Peru. We also have a variety of resources that we put under the bucket of technical assistance and best practices activities. So I encourage you again to check all of that out on the Climate Links website. As I said, Leslie and I are coming to you from ICF. We're the implementing partner for USAID in this activity. We bring a lot of experience to the table to help us design these sorts of uh, projects and um, tools and resources. We've been doing greenhouse gas inventory support for more than 20 years. Our hallmark activity is that we've helped support every annual greenhouse gas inventory for the United States. We've also done a variety of other national greenhouse gas inventories and a lot of registry work, both domestically in the United States as well as worldwide. We've been authoring uh, for many years parts of the IPCC guidelines, including IPCC 2006, uh, contributed to a variety of well-known mitigation protocols and calculators, 
and several of us are on the roster of experts and contributing to things like the GHG protocol and some of the ICAD activities. And through this uh, depth of experience, we've been happy to be able to think through what sort of technical assistance might be needed uh, to support USAID in their efforts to train government officials worldwide on greenhouse gas accounting, NDC tracking, and related activities. So with that introduction, we'll dive right in and talk about this new um, set of resources that are available to you, which we're calling MRV Harmonization Framework. I'm going to take a few moments to talk about this slide. So why are we doing this? What does harmonization mean to us? Well, we discovered uh, that many countries were challenged by the fact that their greenhouse gas emission inventory was being developed with methods and uh, data that might not align with the various activities that are going on through the policies and measures for the mitigation activities taking place in country. And the risk then is that as the greenhouse gas inventory marches forward year on year to show an emission trend, it's possible that that is not capturing the impact of mitigation activities. So recognizing that countries need to monitor the impact of mitigation activities in that, on their national emissions, we started to think through this framework. We also recognize that MRV methods for mitigation actions differ often substantially from the methods used in national inventory reporting. And therefore, those mitigation impacts might not be visible in the emission trajectory. So this harmonization approach helps improve reporting and provide uh, information that can help countries prioritize mitigation investments that have the most impact on the emissions trend. The figure is trying to sort of show this issue, which is in the dotted line that goes straight up, there is a hypothetical BAU scenario of increasing emissions. The green represents what's reported in a country's national inventory. And then the hashed blue area indicates the actual emission reductions from mitigation. The overlap between the blue and the green in the hashed area are those er things that might be happening in country that are not actually reflected in the inventory, and therefore this hypothetical country might show in its emission inventory that they're not reaching a target level of emissions in their target year. And so that's what we're hoping to help everyone address. We've done so by designing this six-step MRV harmonization framework. I'll walk through each of the six steps in turn, and then Leslie will provide much more detailed examples in energy and AFALU sectors. The harmonization framework itself, again, can be found on the Climate Links website that USAID manages, and the hyperlink is provided there. There are three different resources. The Harmonization Framework General Guide presents this six-step approach as an overview. So the six steps include, number one, really identifying what GHG effects are from various policies, measures, or actions by mapping a causal chain. The second step, then, is once you understand the impact on emissions, map those to the IPCC sectors that are used in the national inventory. Once those two steps are completed, really compare the two and look at what we're calling the bottom up, which is the mitigation MRV approaches, and the top down, which is the national level accounting. Compare the two and look to uncover uh, similar items and areas of difference. Once that analysis is done, you can identify where there might be areas that are important to harmonize to make sure that the national inventory reflects those changes that are being forced through mitigation investment. So those four steps are quite analytical and can be done for any number of mitigation actions that are happening in country. Step five is where is less analytical and, and partly more difficult, really prioritizing where those investments can be. There are national inventory improvement plans that can incorporate such changes. There are a variety of priorities any country might have for their 
inventory improvements, and this might be but one of those important activities that a country plans to do next. So the findings of steps one through four need to be prioritized among themselves and among the other priorities that exist for the national inventory team. And then step six is really figuring out how to implement those new changes. That might happen through new institutional arrangements, changes to methodologies, et cetera. And we'll get into some examples in the next few slides. All right, step one. Those of you who are familiar with the GHG protocols policy and action standard might be quite familiar with the mapping of the causal chain. And if you're not, you can look in our resources as well as in that policy and action standard. But fundamentally, you map the causal chain of a policy or action or an activity is what we're calling it, defining the boundaries accordingly to make sure uh, everything is being compared on a similar basis and map the specific outcomes and the GHG impacts of the activity. So we've introduced some vocabulary here where an activity is some sort of policy or action that's being taken. The implementing action is really putting forward the resources or the steps, the specific activities that are, the specific actions that are being taken to achieve that outcome. The outcomes then are changes in behavior, technology, processes, or practices, that are caused by the activity. There could be quite a few, and when mapping the causal chain, you really would need to think through how deep you want to go into the various things that could result from any change. And many of those outcomes have a variety of impacts on greenhouse gas emissions. For example, they might impact both methane and CO2 in any given example. And also, there might be counter effects for any mitigation action that may yield increases in emissions from another part of um, the implementing community. So that was kind of a lot of abstract detail. and hoping you can read the slides here, but I've tried to simplify the causal chain for a simple example in transportation. So in this case, we're uh, talking about a national policy to adopt alternative fuel vehicles over the next 10 years, for example. The activity is an increase in sustainable transportation. One of the implementing actions might be to increase the percentage of alternative fuel vehicles, or I'm oh, sorry, one of the implementing actions might be to do a vehicle standard that requires a certain amount of alternative fuel vehicles in your country. And then the outcome, of course, would be a turnover of the traditional vehicle types that are based on fossil fuels to new types of vehicles that are um, using alternative fuels. So what might that result in? We show three here, a decrease in fossil fuel consumption by vehicles, and those greenhouse gas effects are to reduce emissions, both from the vehicles and from the production and transportation of such fossil fuels. Another impact might be an increase in the use of electricity for transportation, and that might increase emissions from fossil fuel-based electricity sources. And then there's possibly an impact on biofuels, and that, again, might increase emissions from crops or from fertilizer use. And so this is one example that shows a variety of ways that a particular activity might be mapped, and you can see it doesn't only result in changes in the energy sector. So that yields, brings us to step two. Once the causal chain is mapped, we need to map them to the traditional IPCC sectors and source categories. The figure here shows the IPCC sources, or the IPCC methodologies on the bottom right, and then the work that is, uh, on the Columbia inventory as an example on the left. So the sources in IPCC could be in the energy sector, in the industrial process and product use sector, in the AFALU sector, or, or potentially in the waste sector. So once the causal chain is mapped, the work has to be done to connect it to the sectors and sort of the vocabulary that's used by IPCC. Which brings us to step three. This is where the work is done to compare the two. Um, there are a variety of ways that these data or the processes could be compared, and that includes looking at performance metrics and indicators that might be used in these two different methodologies. The methods used, the data points used, 
the sources of such data that are used by the inventory or by the mitigation team doing their MRV. There might even be comparisons you can make about the data elements and how they're collected, such as the frequency of data collection. It's possible that the national inventory uses data that's collected at a frequency of, say, every 10 years uh, for a survey, whereas the mitigation activity might be collecting annual or subannual data. And then institutional arrangements and reporting processes. There could very well be new players that are doing things in the mitigation activities that the inventory team has never uh, ha developed arrangements to collect data from. And then step four would be the work of identifying what can be done about those changes that you've identified. So there are a variety of examples here where the comparison might yield some needs to harmonize the resolution of the data that's used by the inventory to allow for those more granular inputs that would come from the MRV team. The methodological tiers uh, being used, for example, if a default emission factor is used in the tier one methodology at the inventory, might be incapable of capturing some of the changes to that impact uh, national emission factors. So a newer tier might be needed or changes to splice in new emission factors might be warranted. On the far right of this box, you'll see inventory processes. In many cases, the process is perhaps even more important than the data itself because the process of capturing information, splicing it into the inventory, and figuring out what new methods or institutional arrangements need, are needed could be a much harder exercise than doing the calculations once all the data are in hand. Furthering on some ideas for identifying those needs to harmonize in step four, again, the opportunities to harmonize might happen across the entire inventory process or the national inventory system. So walking through this slide, I'll spend just a moment on each, but the, the steps of an inventory are beyond an actual mathematical calculation. So in many cases, they begin with the establishment of institutional arrangements to share data across teams. So one step in harmonization might be to bring more people into those arrangements and get uh, new data collection methods in hand. There might be ways to work with uh, teams who are implementing mitigation activities to, in, to ensure that their data collection feeds the inventory, or maybe that as they design the MRV methods, they are thinking in terms of what can be provided to the national inventory, and there might be a way to influence that so that the data is useful for many purposes. During the development of estimates and the analysis phase of the inventory, uh, there might be ways to estimate emissions in new ways to incorporate those impacts, for example, in uncertainty discussions or in the analysis. Recognizing that the resources are always constrained once a harmonization need is identified, one way to note it without uh, incurring a lot of resource requirements is to simply describe in the uncertainty discussion that there is this additional uncertainty arena that should be um, considered when interpreting the inventory data. Similarly, documenting some of this in the report, either documenting this new data source and changes to your method, or just documenting the fact that you've uncovered some new area of uncertainty is another place where this harmonization can be implemented. And then a final step is in the plan improvement a very low level of effort uh, way to move forward with this harmonization approach is to identify the need to improve the inventory in another manner moving forward and to put that into the planned improvement that you have for the inventory process. Step five is prioritizing those improvements. There are a variety of things that could lead to the prioritization in any given country. Here are just a few examples. Uh, if the mitigation activity impacts a key category in the national inventory, that would be an important one to prioritize. If it has a high mitigation potential and thus a large impact on the trajectory of emissions, that might also be a priority area to invest in. 
Resource availability is always another area to consider. And so there might be some quick wins that can be done if the resources can't be um, expended on the harmonization activity. Leslie will give an example of sensitivity analyses, but there might be some factors that play a very large role in the actual emission estimate. And when those factors are impacted in this harmonization, those should be prioritized. And then finally, the institutional arrangements that exist and how difficult it might be to change those or add new players would be another factor in determining how you prioritize. And then finally, once you've done all the planning, is the implementation step. So this is really where the rubber meets the road, where um, project implementers, agencies, and other key stakeholders can work together to align those findings from the harmonization exercise. So these activities here could include defining additional data requirements, increasing the frequency of data collection, improving a, a tier, an IPCC tier of the inventory method for a source, slicing some subnational data into the national data, forming new or strengthening current arrangements, creating new reporting procedures, or updating the National Inventory Improvement Plan. So the implementation step is really where everything um, gets aligned. And once you've completed steps one through six, you can certify that any of the investments that you've addressed from your mitigation activities and country are, in fact, reflected in the trajectory and the reporting of your national emission statistics. So that's the overall approach. And with that quick review of six steps, We'll get into some details in both the energy and ag sector, and I will turn it over to Leslie. Great, thank you. So as noted, um, we have applied this framework with the government of Colombia and also with Peru. And based on these experiences, we have identified some common themes um, applying the framework to activities within the energy and the AFOLU sector. The energy sector harmonization framework um, will define common greenhouse gas effects that are common among mitigation activities in the energy sector. It provides a mapping of various activity types to inventory sectors and source categories. Defines common data elements for both top-down and bottom-up accounting and identify some examples of harmonization opportunities to align accounting within the energy sector. The energy framework covers three common categories of energy mitigation activities. These were grouped based on their similar impacts to greenhouse gas emissions, with a focus on activities that impact the combustion of fossil fuels, which is often one of the largest source categories that we see in an inventory. The three types of mitigation activities covered in the guidance include electricity generation. This may include the installation of renewable energy, either at a large or small scale, fuel switching for electricity generation, and the use of alternative energy sources. The second activity that we cover is energy efficiency. This may include building or facility level energy efficiency, efficiency gains at power plants, and improvements to transmission and distribution systems. The third category of activity we evaluated was transport. This includes activities that improve fuel efficiency of vehicles, uh, fuel switching to alternative fuel sources, and more behavioral transportation demand management activities. We developed these three categories because they were very common among um, activities that countries are implementing to mitigate emissions in the energy sector. And before we dive into the energy framework, it's important that users will first select an activity that they want to evaluate using the six-step framework. And secondly, identify the stakeholders to include at each stage of the framework. So once again, step one is to identify and map the greenhouse gas effects of the activity. This is where we define the activity 
uh, define the boundaries of the activity and what is included um, in the analysis overall. Uh, this, the causal chain approach was adapted from the Greenhouse Gas Protocol's policy and action standards. So as Marion noted earlier, uh, in this step, we identify the activity, um, the implementing action, which is not shown here, uh, as this is a simplified causal chain, but the specific action that you would take to implement the activity, as well as primary outcomes and secondary outcomes, um, or, or any additional outcomes of which might be intended or unintended from the activity. And then finally, identifying the greenhouse gas emission impact effects. So for this example, we have an activity that increases renewable energy capacity and generation. The main outcomes that will occur as a result of this activity will be to reduce fossil fuel consumption for electricity generation. That may also, in the future, reduce the demand for the expansion or development of new fossil fuel generation. And ultimately, these outcomes will lead to a reduction in emissions from fossil fuel combustion for energy generation, or the energy industry sector. Similarly, depending on where the renewable energy generation occurs, if it's on the grid or off-grid, you may also reduce trans the transmission of electricity from the grid to end users, and that will ultimately reduce losses from electricity transmission and distribution again, leading to a reduction in fossil fuel consumption for electricity generation and reducing emissions associated with that combustion. At the end of the step, uh, users will have an understanding of the key outcomes, both, again, intended and unintended of the activity, as well as an understanding of how the activity will ultimately impact greenhouse gas emissions. And the causal chain, again, can be much more expansive than this. Um, based on the policy and action standard, um, you can look at um, additional impacts, but we recommend considering ultimately what are the largest impacts that you will have uh, that will impact your greenhouse gas emissions and ultimately your inventory. The second step in the framework, again, is to map the greenhouse gas effects to the inventory. These are the greenhouse gas effects that were identified in step one in the causal chain. In the energy framework, we have identified a standard mapping of effects of these common mitigation activities to IPCC categories. So here you can see the examples for electricity generation, energy efficiency, and transportation activities. One main point I want to make from this is that while these activities largely impact categories in the energy sector, such as the 1A1 energy industries or the 1A3 transport sector within fossil fuel combustion, some of your activities, for example, activities that increase the use of alternative fuel vehicles within the transportation sector, might also have impacts in additional IPCC categories. So here you can see that the affluent sector will be impacted by the use of alternative fuel vehicles, depending on the type of fuel. So if you increase the use of biofuels, you are likely to have impacts associated with additional crop production for the feedstock for that biofuel. So still within step two, another concept that we talk about within the energy framework is a pathway. And we consider this as basically the way in which a mitigation activity will affect emissions and ultimately the greenhouse gas inventory. We saw, based on the causal chains that we evaluated for the example activities, that there are some common greenhouse gas effects. These include reducing emissions from fossil fuel combustion in energy, the energy industry sector, or potentially increasing those emissions depending on the activity, uh, reducing emissions in other sectors, including residential, commercial, and uh, industrial sectors, or the transportation sector, or again, other sectors such as affluent. So based on these common greenhouse gas effects that we we're seeing based on the simplified causal chain, we identified that there are a limited number of pathways 
um, that will ultimately impact or move the lever of emissions within the energy sector from fossil fuel use. So activities will primarily change the activity data, for example, the use of different fuel types or the emission factors uh, used to estimate emissions. In step three, again, uh, we assess the bottom-up and top-down uh, accounting um, for the activity. So in the energy framework, we have identified some common data elements for methodologies that are used in national inventory reporting and also for uh, common methodologies used for bottom-up MRV. The bottom-up MRV will depend on country-specific circumstances, however, the uh, table, such as the, the one on this slide, are a summary of the common data elements that you will see. So as you can see, there are several data elements that are common across the activities, both between the national inventory or top-down accounting and the bottom-up accounting. And this can be helpful when you're trying to understand the alignment issues that you might have between the top-down and bottom-up accounting. Step four is to identify harmonization needs. This is where, again, the framework is very specific to country circumstances. However, there are some questions that can be asked across circumstances um, to determine kind of at a high level whether or not the inventory is currently capturing uh, mitigation impacts and also identifying potential opportunities to harmonize accounting in the future. So questions to consider include, first of all, uh, does the inventory use data from mitigation projects? So for example, if you have a voluntary reporting program for um, industrial mitigation activities, it's possible that that might be incorporated into the inventory already as part of the data collection process. Similarly, does the existing inventory method reflect country-specific circumstances? If you're already using country-specific emission factors or other factors used in the calculation, you are likely to be able to see more of the impact of changing circumstances within the country, depending on how frequently that factor is updated. And then finally, are data updated frequently enough to capture changing trends? So if you have a mitigation activity that is very active at changing either, again, a factor that's used in the calculations or uh, in the activity data, such as fuel use, for example, um, are you collecting that data annually or every couple of years? Is it frequent enough to see, really, that you are changing um, your emissions trajectory? So once you've looked at a macro level at whether the national inventory captures mitigation impacts, you can look, uh, again, back to that top-down and bottom-up comparison to identify opportunities for harmonization. So within your top-down and bottom-up methods, are you using the same data elements? Do you have the same attributes of those data elements? So for example, are you using the same data sources? and our data being collected at a similar frequency. And then finally, um, thinking about ways that the MRV of the mitigation activity or the inventory methods or processes could be changed to align accounting. At the bottom of this slide, we have an example from the energy sector looking at top-down and bottom-up methodologies um, for an energy, a fuel consumption activity. And we identified that potential alignment issues might include that the methods are using different data elements, they have different frequency of data collection, and they also are relying on different sources of information. So those may represent potential opportunities to align accounting between the two processes. The fifth step is to prioritize improvements. Um, so once again, as Marian mentioned, this is where you have, you step back from the analysis a little bit and you think um, more within the context of overall country priorities, what might um, help achieve the country's 
um, targets and achieve other national priorities um, in terms of the opportunities that were identified in step four. So some things to consider, uh, again, are the mitigation potential of an activity, whether it is intended to be a large player in helping the country meet its NDC commitments. If the activity impacts a key category or one of the largest sources of emissions within the national inventory. Also considering which data elements have the largest impact on emissions. So if you have an emission factor, for example, that really has a very small window of um, variance um, versus activity data, which may be really driving your trends in emissions, you might want to focus on improving the accuracy or aligning the accounting for the data elements that's going to have the largest impact on your overall emission estimate. And finally, considering these and the other um, considerations Marion identified in her slides, um, prioritize the improvements that were identified in step four for those categories that are ultimately going to have the largest impact. An example of how to do this is shown on the right. Um, so you can conduct a sensitivity analysis, um, which is varying each input, for example, by plus or minus 10% to determine the relative impact that that variable will have on the inventory calculation. So in this particular example, within the 1A1 energy industries category, we can see that CO2 emission factor for coal combustion is going to have the largest impact um, on overall emissions. So if there are any opportunities to align accounting that um, address this particular variable or some of the top three variables, again, that will have the largest impact on your overall emissions estimate. Finally, um, we have an example of applying the energy sector framework uh, to uh, an activity within Columbia. So again, we had developed this framework initially and pilot tested it with the government of Columbia. Um, we looked at one example for their renewable energy, uh, NAMA, which calls for increasing the share of renewable energy in the non-interconnected zone within Columbia. So going back through the steps, the type of activity we have is the electricity generation activity, specifically renewable energy. This activity will impact uh, the three categories, so 1A1 energy industries within fossil fuel combustion, 1A2 manufacturing and construction industries, and 1A4 other sectors which includes the residential, commercial, and industrial sectors. After conducting the evaluation, we determined that the inventory will capture the impact of the mitigation activity. This is in part because renewable energy inherently, uh, specifically solar, has, uh, is associated with zero emissions, but also is because of the data. So given improvements that the country was making to their energy data collection, within the non-interconnected zone and getting an, a, a thorough understanding of their baseline energy consumption that would be offset by renewable energy activities and installation. Ultimately, we determined that the inventory will see changes within that sector to, to, um, based on renewable energy installation. Next, um, we will go through the um, AFALU sector example. We'll go through this a little bit more briefly. Um, again, we have this resource, the AFALU framework, uh, harmonization framework, which is available through Climate Link. It's similar to the energy framework, helps to identify common greenhouse gas impacts or effects of the common mitigation activities, helps to map those mitigation activities to the national inventory, identifies common data elements we saw between bottom-up and top-down accounting, and identifies potential opportunities to align accounting. The AFLU guidance covers 
seven categories of mitigation actions within the AFLU sector. This includes livestock management activities, which improve, include improved feed quality, herd management, and livestock waste management. Crapland management activities, such as reducing crop residue burning. Grassland management activities, such as pasture rehabilitation. Forest management activities, such as afforestation and reforestation, avoided deforestation and improved forest management. Wetlands management, including rewetting, restoration, and wetlands con uh, or avoided wetlands conversion. Settlement management. And then finally, bioenergy activities. Once again, we have a simplified example causal chain. This is for a pasture rehabilitation activity. So the general activity is pasture rehabilitation. That may include multiple implementing actions, uh, which were not included in, in this um, figure. The primary outcomes of that activity are an increase in ingestion, which will lead to an increase in emissions from enteric fermentation, um, and also an increase in emissions from manure and urine. An increase in the efficiency of ingestion due to improved feed quality, which will ultimately lead to an increase in livestock efficiency and productivity, and a decrease in emissions per unit of product that is created, so an increase in productivity along with uh, an increase in um, the overall emissions, however, a per unit decrease. And then finally, it will lead to an increase in dry matter and organic matter in soil, which will lead to an increase in carbon stored in soil, which serves as a carbon sink. Similar to the energy activity, we have identified a standard mapping of these mitigation activities to IPCC sectors. Once again, we see that while a lot of the impacts do occur within the AFLU sectors, that includes um, livestock as well as uh, land use and other um, AFLU emission sources, we also do have some impacts in other sectors, including uh, the energy sector, fuel combustion activities, as well as the uh, biological treatment of solid waste within the waste. Once again, distilling these common greenhouse gas effects that we see, um, as well as the inventory mappings that we identified uh, on the previous slide, we identified common pathways and ways within which these activities will ultimately impact emissions within the greenhouse gas inventory. So as an example, mitigation activities that reduce methane emissions from enteric fermentation um, will impact the activity data or emission factors used in this particular source category of enteric fermentation, 3A1. Again, we identified common top-down and bottom-up elements, um, which can help to assess the similarities and differences between data elements. Within the AFLU sector, uh, we found that there were quite a lot of commonalities between the top-down and bottom-up accounting methods. So as a result, there were significant opportunities to align um, accounting and identify where uh, emission factors or data elements or other components of the calculations might not be fully aligned. And step four, again, harmonizing, identifying harmonization needs. Um, so this will rely on country-specific uh, circumstances. However, there are some common types of alignment issues that we identified. So for one example, um, for animal population data used for the enteric and manure um, management calculations, we identified that, for example, in the top-down methodology, you might have a national data set such as animal vaccination records um, that feed into the national inventory. But for the, the mitigation activity, the population data are much more project-specific and obtained from direct measurement or reported values from farmers. 
Therefore, when you're looking to compare the um, results of the inventory and the mitigation activity, you might have some alignment issues associated with the source of data and also the completeness of data. For prioritizing improvements um, within the AFLU sector, again, you may want to consider what is your largest emission source. So this graphic on the right uh, shows a breakdown of global greenhouse gas emissions by sources. You can see at the global level, agriculture emissions are associated with about 11% of overall global emissions. This may vary widely within a country, however. So if AFLU is a very large source within a particular country, um, if deforestation, for example, is a main driver of emissions, it may be particularly critical to look at opportunities to improve the institutional arrangements, data collection, and methods associated with the MRV of those activities, as they are large, likely to play a large role in helping the country to meet its NDC commitments. Finally, we end with an example based on our experience working with Columbia. So under Columbia's Livestock NAMA, one of the activities that they are implementing is uh, decreasing emissions by improving pasture through activities such as rotational grazing and thereby improving the feed quality for livestock on pasture. This activity is a pasture rehabilitation activity and it has impacts in five IPCC sectors, including the most direct impacts for 3A1 enteric fermentation, 3A2 manure management, but also for land use categories of grassland remaining grasslands, land converted to grasslands, and then also indirect N2O emissions from manure management. Based on our assessment of the um, activity and our application of the six-step framework, we determined that as is, the inventory will not capture impacts of the mitigation activity. Based on that status quo assessment, we developed specific recommendations. So these are the types of opportunities that might come out of this analysis that will ultimately be prioritized based on country circumstances. So example recommendations to align the top-down and bottom-up accounting for this particular activity include to collect livestock population data for all livestock categories, um, in specifically in the mitigation project areas. So where you have the most changing circumstances within the country where the activities are being implemented, making sure that you're capturing data on more than just dairy and non-dairy cattle, but also additional livestock um, categories uh, of animal population in order to feed into more accurate estimates within the national inventory. Also, updating enteric emission factors more frequently uh, will ensure that as the, in, the feed quality improves and other pasture conditions change, that the emission factors used in the inventory, um, for example, milk yield, weight, feed digestibility, um, will reflect changing trends in the sector and ultimately capture the mitigation um, implementation with the specific activities. Next, we recommended calculating inputs for methane and direct nitrous oxide emission factors for manure management based on the information that was being collected as part of the enteric fermentation calculation. And finally, recommending using direct measurement or models to estimate soil organic carbon pool changes where applicable. And again, this is particularly relevant where the activity was being implemented, which was in um, a handful of regions. That concludes our formal presentation. Um, at this point, we would like to open up the line for any questions. So if you have a question, please type it in the question and answer um, box within Adobe Connect. We will read your question aloud, and then we will, um, we will provide a response.
Okay, one question we have is if you are getting a PDF copy of the slide deck. And yes, we will make both the recording of the webinar and the slides available to all attendees following the webinar. We will pause for a few minutes. If you have questions, please type them into the Q&A section of the webinar. Of course, you're always welcome to reach out to us directly. The next slide will have some of our contact information. We encourage you to go to the uh, web links that are provided so far in the deck and will be repeated and held at the next slide for a few moments um, to look into these resources and uh, reach out to us with questions on your own time. But we will, again, remain on the line for a few more minutes to see if you have any Q&A for us. Our contact information is showing on the screen right now. We'll leave that up for a minute or so, and then we'll go to the next slide, which has some of the resource links. And um, you can find them at USA's Climate Links. There's another question here which discusses whether or not there's specific work being done under HVAC, which is heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. We have not performed that analysis explicitly in the, uh, in the documents that we have shared. What we have done are the sectors and examples that we present in the AFALU and in the energy guidance, as well as the cross-cutting framework. To the extent that you uh, have specific areas such as HVAC, we hope that these tools, specifically the generic framework and perhaps the energy one, will provide you with the process that you can take to perform that analysis for HVAC yourself or with uh, some HVAC experts, et cetera. Uh, any type of specific mitigation action or policy between um, the policy and action standard that's been put out by the GHG protocol series and this harmonization framework series, we hope that you'll be able to replicate the type of analysis that we have provided. We're continuing to see some requests for the slides. We will certainly follow up with all of the slides. I also understand some people on the line had trouble with the audio, and we will make sure that we follow up uh, with a link to this presentation and with the slides. We received a question, uh, what were some of the challenges you encountered trying to harmonize MRV and greenhouse gas inventories in Colombia? Um, so Colombia has a very robust national inventory system, um, and they also have uh, a significant um, improvement plan uh, and, and very helpful reporting. Um, they also have uh, established data collection procedures, for example, with their national energy balance that is very um, thorough and captures a lot of the, um, or it captures all of the energy consumption within the, um, the country itself. 
I would say one of the biggest challenges in implementing this framework um, in Colombia and also in other places is that as the NDC implementation is at its nascent stage um, and as the MRV is still being defined, there's not a lot of information being collected at the bottom-up level. And so to do the analysis, we relied on international standards for the bottom-up accounting as well as interviews with the implementers of the mitigation activities. On the one hand, this was a challenge because the data was not necessarily available at the, the bottom-up level. However, it was also an opportunity because as the implementers were defining the MRV systems for their activity, um, they could align those MRV systems with the national inventory accounting. And we found it particularly helpful to have the inventory team and the mitigation activities uh, implementers talking to one another and understanding the common challenges with accounting and potential opportunities. It was a similar challenge that we had in Peru. Um, specifically, one, one activity that we looked at was within the transportation sector within Lima. And the activity had actually been established and had an MRV um, system in place. And so um, while, on the other hand, some of the, the other activities um, were not quite as well defined on the MRV side. So um, the challenge of having an MRV system already established um, is, again, that you might not have the data necessary to inform the inventory. Uh, but again, that is an opportunity to have the implementers as well as the inventory team connect with one another and talk about those common challenges. I would also add that some of the challenges in implementing this are fundamentally getting started because there are a host of priorities for any inventory team. And of course, that's the case in the countries we've worked with. And so just moving to the very stage where you identify which priority mitigation actions to push through this framework is a bit of a process that involves a variety of stakeholders within a variety of ministries to identify you know, where to do the analysis that will likely yield the most impact. So renewable energy, for example, is one that is uh, being invested in, in a lot of places, it's tricky from an inventory perspective because it's not present, the emissions are zero, but it's also very important for inventory teams to be able to assert that the impact of the investments and the uh, advancement of renewable energy in the country is being adequately captured in the emission trends as shown in the inventory. And so in the case of Colombia, that became a, a high priority. But it was a bit of a conversation because renewable energy is zero emissions. So it wasn't in the inventory in the first place, fundamentally. So I think that the challenges that others might encounter in moving forward in this harmonization is really defining um, which types of mitigation activities to focus on for the framework first, and then creating those relationships with the people who are doing work in that space a country might have a NAMA, for example, and know a few of the key players, but there might be a broader set of stakeholders than, um, than the inventory team may be aware of or have relationships with. And so building up um, those relationships, those interpersonal relationships, in such a way to allow a confident and um, trusting exchange of information and exchange of data to the ultimate end of, of improving the inventory can be a bit of a political challenge. But I think once everyone understands the ultimate outcome, I think that helps get through um, those challenges so that the analytical work can begin. Thank you for asking the question. We've reached the top of the hour, and I see no further questions coming in through the line. On the screen are the long hyperlinks. You can find these on the climate links. Just Google climate links and rally, and you'll be able to find some of these. But here are the links themselves. And we will circulate this um, deck and also post it on the climate links website for you to review if you were not able to join us early. Thanks, everyone, for attending today. It was great to spend this hour together. Appreciate your time and hope you find these resources helpful.